Thanks. Working now. <gasps> Good morning. I think the microphone was on summer holidays. Um, so welcome. Uh, we've got a small but mighty crew here in the church today, and we welcome everyone joining us online. My name is Christine, and it's been a long time since I've been like in this part of the sanctuary or on your um, this side of the screen. Um, and so it's great. I'm just here to share some information with you this morning, um, some updates. And I know it's summer, but like I have paid of things to share this morning so that's totally awesome and I have to I have notes because I have to keep myself organized um, if you're online please say hello in the chat share um, like just message the, during the service it's great for people to see what others are thinking um, shout outs and things like that so we love to see that you're online and um, greet each other um, and make that a community uh, amongst yourselves. Um, and there are links below um, the video for um, online um, prayer after the service. Um, there will not be coffee hour during the summer. We're taking a little break um, from doing the coffee hour online. Um, and so we'll let you know when that starts back up again. But right now we have prayer only online and we have prayer in person. So if you're here today and would like prayer, please consider um, staying for that. Um, so other things, if you get the Calvary Connects emails, you will have seen there's going to be an information night. Um, Matt and Hanukkah Williams were here a few weeks ago sharing about um, what they do overseas. And so they have an information night here at Calvary on July the 17th. Um, you need to pre-register for that. So please contact Kelly if you want information about that or if you want to pre-register um, to hear more about what they do overseas, which is really cool because they gave you a little bit of a sneak peek here um, on a Sunday morning, but they can share more um, when there are no cameras rolling. So that sounds like a int very interesting evening um, for sure, July the 17th. Um, also contact Kelly. Kelly, I hope you're busy with people contacting you. <laughs> um, for, about Calvary goes to camp. So there are families um, and, and people. Uh, it's not just families, so it's Calvary. It's everyone here um, that are registered and that are interested in going to Silver Lake Camp on the August long weekend. So they're looking for a few more groups of people um, to kind of make it worthwhile. And um, please contact Kelly about that. So they're just really excited we get to do this again. Oh, there's already six families. Just to encourage others, if you thought you're going to be the only one, well, that wouldn't be terrible either at Silver Lake, right? But there's already people there. So the more the merrier, and uh, it's a great community gathering and a great place to be. So please consider that for the long weekend, which is coming up because it actually is like the last weekend in July is the long weekend in August. <laughs> so just so you, yeah, so it's coming up. Um, so please, again, contact Kelly about that. Um, I have an announcement from the search committee. So in February at the general uh, annual general meeting, um, it was voted on and passed that a search committee be formed um, to look into hiring a new, um, a second ministerial staff here to join to our join our team. Um, and so the search committee has been formed. Um, and I'm going to just tell you who those people are in case you have questions or want to talk to anyone on the committee. So it's Jane, Angie, Cindy, Doug, Jordan, Debbie, Andrew, Sharon, and myself. Uh, and we're hoping to update the congregation regularly as things progress. And progress is being made. So a couple of updates for you today. Regional Council has approved the job description. Uh, and it has been posted on a church on Church Hub. So Church Hub is like uh, a United Church of Canada website where all the job postings go. And any uh, interested ministers go there. Their resumes are on there too. So it's like a central place. So the posting is on Church Hub um, currently. And at this time, we're just waiting for applications. So um, what the search committee does want from our church family um, is um, continued prayer. And so we know that God has already chosen the perfect person uh, to bless us at Calvary with their pastoral heart and gift for igniting community. And we want everyone here to be a part of that and to share in that. So if you'll continue to pray for that person um, and discernment for the search committee, we would really appreciate that. That information I'll put on Calvary Connects on Wednesday um, in case anyone missed it or just wants the names of who's on the committee for that. So we're super excited about that. That's rolling, even during a pandemic. 
it's been rolling. So thank you to everyone on that committee for meetings and Zoom meetings and researching and prepping the job description and um, an m and for getting all that taken care of through regional council. Awesome job, everybody. Um, we have a number of our Calvary family members heading to Silver Lake today. Yay! So leadership development camp is starting today. Um, and we'll pray for them in just a moment. But so they're going to be at LID camp. And then um, part of something they're going to do is an opportunity here at Calvary on July 12th to the 14th. Um, and because the youth are coming here, they are going to need food. And so there is a little um, food ministry happening. Um, if you are interested in um, preparing food, donating food for them, um, July 12th to 14th, on the events page on calvaryunited.com, um, and Kelly put the link below also, go and check out what kinds of food that they need for that week. So things like lasagna, sloppy joes, cookies, juice. So if you are just a go to the store and buy it kind of a person, there's hummus, there's granola bars. Um, if you love making things, this is a chance for you. And I just feel like if you are a person who misses um, cooking for large crowds, like for a year and a half you haven't cooked for a large crowd, like this is the moment for you, <laughs> right? So I feel, like, I feel like that might heal your, um, you know, your um, meal ministry heart as much as it will fill their bellies. So please consider that. <laughs> Kathy's laughing, but I know she's gonna sign up. <laughs> so please consider that. Um, again, contact Kelly if you have any questions. There are links, you just, you just go on and you just put, type your name in and it tells you when you need to have the food here by and how much. So please consider doing that for our LID um, youth and, and the people who are helping to run it as well. Um, and I think that's like all the information that I had. Before we prepare our hearts for worship, if you are at home, please gather your communion items. So any kind of food item, bread, um, juice, wine, something to help you um, share the, the body and the blood this morning. Um, so now's your chance to go in and, and grab that, uh, those elements. So let's prepare our hearts for worship, and um, I want to start by praying for our, for our LID um, leadership development um, camp this morning. Heavenly Father, we raise up Rhonda to you and ask that you guide her and the directing team this week. Give them opportunities to ignite a longing for leadership in the youth. We pray for Trent. Jade, Xander, Braden, and Emma. Lord, show these youth their spiritual gifts as leaders and allow them to use those gifts for your glory. Continue to release Holy Spirit at Silver Lake and beyond. Heavenly Father, meet us here today where we are, both physically, spiritually. Make us aware of your presence that we may draw closer to you and be forever changed. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we get to join with all the voices of heaven this morning as we work. Hello, good morning, everyone. Great to be here on a holiday weekend. Let me start by uh, showing my latest tattoo. I don't know if you can see. Can you see that? Is that? Oh, Steve got it. Okay, thank you. My four-year-old grandson on Canada Day was uh, doing these um, wash-on or wipe-on tattoos. So Grandpa had to get one. I'm liking it. It's, it's fading already, but that's okay. On a Canada Day holiday weekend, um, I wanted to start there, actually, because this is a pretty unique Canada Day for a lot of us as Canadians, uh, and I wanted to address that. Overall, this morning, I want to talk about citizenship, and I'm going to get to dual citizenship that we all should recognize that we have. But I want to start with the Canada 
thing. First of all, let me read you a couple of scriptures. This is from the first letter of Peter. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority. And he goes on. So that's Peter in, his, in a letter. But in Acts chapter 5, Peter and the apostles replied to the ruling Jerusalem authorities. Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Sounds like Peter's in his letter saying, submit yourselves to all authorities. When he's brought in front of the Jerusalem council, he says, we must submit to God rather than men. What should a Christian's relationship be to earthly governing authorities? Who is sovereign? Who should have authority and when should they have it? For those of us who are citizens of an earthly nation and a heavenly kingdom. You see the contrast. That is an old enduring tension for the Christian citizen. Peter says we must obey God rather than men. And yet he recognizes that we should, whenever possible, follow earthly authorities. St. Paul in Romans chapter 13 said, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Seems pretty clear. Within a decade, Paul was executed by the governing authority, Caesar, because he was deemed a danger and a threat to the authority of the Roman Empire. And so here we are on Canada Day 2021, and we know what's gone on, and it's hard to hear about it. Let me go into that for just a few moments. Uh, I'm going to read you three things. I'm going to read you a statement from one of our First Nations people. We're going to hear and pray a prayer. And then I'm going to read you something from a refugee who landed in Canada. First, this. So a friend of mine asked if we should celebrate Canada Day. I share my opinion and qualify it by saying, I am Mohawk of the Six Nations. And here's his opinion. Bow your head in sadness, not shame. You didn't write the laws that made these places. You didn't run the churches that made these decisions. Your government, my government too, did that. <laughs> Old dead prime ministers <laughs> did that. Old dead popes, priests, priests, preachers, and nuns did that. The country we live in was founded in exploitation, murder, genocide, and thievery. But every country in the world is. You didn't know about these children because the government didn't want you to know. Now you know about them. You know about us. You are beginning to understand what we have gone through and are going through. So stand up. Celebrate Canada Day if you want, but celebrate it because we have been found. Celebrate it because our children are being recovered. Celebrate it because you don't want this country to repeat what they have done. I just found that profoundly helpful to hear and uh, this elder finished by saying, we have been here since Mother Earth bore the first brothers and sisters. We will be here when Grandfather Moon puts Mother Earth to sleep. We have always been here, but now you finally see us. Uh, we call it Heavenly Father Creator. They call uh, Mother Earth, Grandfather Moon, 
I can live with that. They have a great love and respect. So that's the first thing I wanted to read to you. Now I'd like us to pray, and I'm, I'm using, quoting most of a prayer that was written, I think, by our moderator of the United Church of Canada. It comes from the United Church website. So I didn't write this, but I found it helpful. Let us pray. It's a very hard day, O oh God. The, the details are staggering and we can barely breathe. 1,505 bodies hidden in unmarked graves so far at sites operated by our brothers and sisters in faith. Kamloops, Brandon, Maryval, Cranbrook. And it's a very hard day, O oh God, a stifling heat wave so intense that the entire village of Lytton was destroyed by a flash fire. Statues toppled. Churches burned. And so for today, O oh God, we pray. It's hard to be a Canadian, a citizen of this land. It's hard to be the church to claim our relationship with your living Christ. It's hard to sing the songs of our faith and speak of our healing grace when both Canada and the church have conspired against your holy creation. We cry out sadness and lament. We seek your holy grace as we attempt to find a better way. May the words of our mouths match the actions of steps so that your holy kingdom has a chance. May we not be so consumed by our horror and grief that we are blocked from taking one step. A phone call, a letter, an orange t-shirt, an invitation into fellowship extended. Oh God, empower our living when we are powerless. Guide our feet when they have lost their way. May we, the Church of Christ's own way, for your creation's mending. For it's in that holy name, Christ our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Again, a good prayer. Now, the last thing I want to read to you, um, everything I present this morning and share with you, I, I have two things. I want to comfort and I want to challenge. And this first half is actually mostly comfort, although I reminded us all of residential schools and fires and all of that. But I want to to give comfort in this first half. In the second half, I'll challenge and we'll get into the book of Acts and uh, other things. This, I want to read as a, a balance, a reassurance. I love being Canadian, always have. And I'm still, yeah, I'm still proud to be a Canadian. Here's one of the reasons. This is really getting to me, you can tell. <clears throat> and that's okay. Let me read you this. It's from a young woman, a Canadian. Uh, I've never met her personally, but she was sitting on the dock at our cottage yesterday. Uh, her husband is a co-worker of my son, and they, they've been at the cottage for the last... I was born in Saigon, Vietnam. Over 40 years ago, my parents, in the middle of the night, got on a boat with me and my sisters and left Vietnam, left everything, becoming one family out of hundreds of thousands who are now referred to in the history books as the boat people. Growing up, I struggled with my identity. When I looked in the mirror, I saw that little refugee boat girl, and I wanted to hide her. Over time, over experience, while the reflection of the little refugee boat girl will never leave me, the feelings of hidden shame have long gone and been replaced with full gratitude and pride for the selfless sacrifices of my parents 
And the purest generosity of the families from the little United Church in Elmvale, Ontario. I preached there, little United Church, who sponsored and afforded me the opportunity to live safe and live free, to raise my family safe and free, to forever look in the mirror to see the little refugee boat girl smiling back. Isn't that great? Yeah. I love being Canadian. I'm so disappointed how we went wrong, and our government went wrong in the residential schools. Uh, however, I'm not going to let that wipe out how much good Canada has done and is still doing. And as a disciple of Jesus, I want us to go down that road forever. The good are better angels. So, all of that uh, to say, happy Canada Day weekend, and may we be good citizens in every sense, and I'll give you more in a few moments, but may we be good citizens both of this earthly nation and of the heavenly kingdom. Amen. Thanks, Dave and band. I pulled my mic off, sorry. Got a little excited. Let me know if that's not working. I'm hoping you can still hear me. All right. Part two. Um, I'm leaving Canada, Canada Day behind. I want to focus in on Scripture, the book of Acts, and the early church. And to start that, as a little preview, I, I think Steve's got a map for us. Can you throw that on screen, Steve? Uh, and let's... I just want to show everybody. Ah, good, great. That's a lot clearer. Okay, there's the first century Mediterranean world. As you can see, far left, Rome, Italy. Um, more to the, over to the right, the large print, Galatia. That's now the country of Turkey, province of Galatia. We have a letter in the New Testament, the letter to the Galatians. But there's also a letter to Ephesus. See the Ephesians there? There's a letter to Corinth. Turn left from Ephesus over to Corinth. There's two letters to the Corinthians. Um, and there's a number of letters. The cities aren't named up there. But if you go straight up from Athens, right up to the top of the Aegean Sea, that's where Philippi is. And Thessalonica is just along and down from it. And there's several letters from the New Testament there as well. So what I want to do is read you from Acts chapter 15 and 16. We're going to read some of Paul's journeys. And he, he's moving around that area that you just saw. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the believers in every city where we proclaim the word of God and see how they're doing. Paul chose Silas and set out, the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria. We've heard of that. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul went on also to Derbe and to Lystra. Those are in that Turkey, Galatia area, where there was a disciple named Timothy. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, there it is, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. If when they were in Galatia, Galatia, Turkey, they went to the right, east, they would have been going into Asia. They were told, no, don't go that way, stay to the left, stay in Europe.
What do you think of that? Can, can, okay. All right, I hope you got your coffee. Hurry up, get back. <laughs> um, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. And then it says, we set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samor Samothrace the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi. Now, Steve, can you pop that map up again just quick? So there in Philippi, do you see where it says Achaia, Athens, Corinth? See those? Go straight up from there to the top of the Aegean Sea. Philippi is way up there. That's where he is now. He's come through Galatia, and a b bunch of towns were mentioned in there, Derb, Lystra. They're not on the map, but he's come through there, and now he's gone up to the top, and he's at Philippi. And in Philippi, there's this fabulous story. Many of you have probably heard it, remember it. Paul gets arrested. He gets thrown in jail. There's an earthquake. Um, he could have escaped. Let me just read you parts of it, but I'm fast-forwarding through some of it. We remained in this city, Philippi, for some days. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. After they had given, I'm fast forwarding, after they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Now see, I just jumped 12 verses from 23 to 35, and that's where there was an earthquake. They could have escaped. The Roman jailer becomes a Christian. It's marvelous stuff. Go home and read it, Acts chapter 16. When morning came, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported the message to Paul saying, the magistrates sent word to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul replied, he's not messing with these guys. Paul replied, they have beaten us in public, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens. That's the golden passport, baby. Roman citizens, and they have thrown us into prison. Now they're going to discharge us in secret? Certainly not. Let them come and take us out themselves. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out, asked them to leave the city. After leaving the prison, they went to Lydia's home, and when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters there, they departed. So the book of Acts is just so fascinating to read, both the history but also the personal interactions, uh, to, to know and follow Paul's journeys on the map, but also know there's... There are power dynamics in play here. He's a Roman citizen. That's like, uh, I don't know if there's any equivalent in our modern world. There was no other power. There were no superpowers other than the Roman Empire. And Paul's got the get out of jail free card. He's got the passport. His citizenship in this earthly empire is huge. I want to think about that with you. And here's where I'm going to start. I'm sure none of you have ever heard this or sung it before. Jesus bids us shine with a clear, pure light, like a little candle burning in the night. <laughs> no. You've heard it before, right? In this world of darkness, so let us shine, you in your small corner and I in mine. 
So goes the children's hymn. I love it. I'm inspired by it. The hopeful yet challenging message it gives, like a little candle burning in the light, in this world of darkness, so let us shine. Isn't that a challenging image? All of us are to be light in the darkness. The idea that Jesus' followers are to let their light shine in our world, that's an idea that's been around for a long time, for many centuries. When I read the letters from the early church, when I read of Paul's journeys through Acts, it seems like it could have been the way the first Christians understood themselves from the very beginning. Listen, this is the letter to the Philippians, that city way at the top of the Adriatic Sea. The letter to Philippi, Paul wrote in chapter 3, we are a colony of heaven. We're a colony. So Paul pictured the early church as all the churches he planted as kind of tiny outposts, colonies of heaven. In a different translation, it actually says this, our citizenship is in heaven. He's a Roman citizen, but he writes and says, our citizenship is in heaven. Paul and many first century Christians not only felt called to let their light shine, they also saw themselves as having dual citizenship. I have a little grandson, one year old. He was born in London, England. But both his parents are Canadian, and he will have dual citizenship. He can claim a British passport because he was born there, and he can also claim a Canadian. He won't be doing that for 15 years or so, but <clears throat> there it is, dual citizenship. On the one hand, earthly members of a society, a city, an empire, Rome, while at the same time members of the kingdom of heaven, the family of God, living under the reign of Christ. Now, it's not surprising they thought this way when you know the world that they lived in. What a chaotic, unbalanced world the Roman Empire was. Paul wrote letters to people in numerous cities where he had started all these fledgling little house church congregations. And there's fascinating challenges. Corinth, for example. Steve, one more time, throw that uh, map up. We have two letters, at least two letters, to the Corinthians. Do you see Corinth? Almost right in the very center of the page. Corinth was the second largest city in the Roman Empire. Rome was the biggest, obviously. But Corinth in Greece was three quarters of a million people. And that's huge in that ancient world. Half of the population were slaves. Half the population of Corinth were slaves doing all the work. Women and children tending households and gardens, men doing hard manual labor. Half the population slaves. It was also the shipping and travel center because it's on a little isthmus. You can't really see on that map. Don't put it back, Steve. But it was on a narrow little isthmus with water on both sides and so they had, and, and a port on both sides, and the city kind of straddled this isthmus. They had people coming from every direction and on land coming across. It's, it was kind of the hub, center, of that Greco-Roman world, other than Rome. Corinth was full of people because of where it was. Uh, it was a combination of London, England, a business and travel hub, and Las Vegas. It really was an entertainment hub. Corinth was full of people who wanted to make money and have fun. So it carried all the characteristics we can expect. Power, exploitation, excess, violence to subdue anyone who objected. Into, yet into this culture, this society, with so much disparity and poverty and violence and wealth and 
affluence into this comes the beginnings of a new movement. People who live by a completely different value system. They seem wacko to a lot of the residents. Christ followers. Instead of being driven by exploitation, instead of the intimidation and violence prevalent in a military police state, instead of uncontrolled desire for excess in pleasure and amusement, these people are different. They are a counterculture, an alternative society, a tiny island of compassion, self-control, community. Corinth had never seen this before. A group of people who are faithful to their promises, who love their enemies, who tell the truth, who serve the poor, who suffer for righteousness, who visibly demonstrate the amazing community-creating power of the living God. These Christians didn't withdraw from the society around them, but they were visibly different. They were a colony. Now, what does that mean, a colony? A colony is a, an outpost, a beachhead, uh, an island of one culture in the middle of another vast, bigger culture. A colony is this place where a different set of values and lifestyle are lived out and passed on. So let me try an idea on you. Perhaps it sounds a bit overly dramatic to describe churches today as colonies in the middle of an alien culture. Yet it, it's an idea that is beginning to be put forward by trusted observers. Recently I read two uh, professors from Duke University, um, one's the professor of ethics and the other of theology. Listen to what they said, and I think Steve can, you know, he's got it, thanks Steve. We believe the designations of the church as a colony and Christians as resident aliens are not too strong for the modern North American church. Things have changed. The church is a colony, an island of one culture in the middle of another. They go on to say that at its best, it is the nature of the church. It's our job to be a colony at any time in every situation. And friends, I think they're right. In some way, to some degree, we Christians are always to be a counterculture, an alternative community. So let me think about, let, let's think about that together and mentally explore it. There are a couple of things to note immediately. For one thing, the borderlines between society and the church can get blurry. And I think that's, that's probably good. That society still has much of what we want the church to have. Justice and generosity, all of that. The borderline, on occasion, there will be very little difference between the two societies, two cultures. And that's fine when the dominant society around is living by Christian values. Then it's good. But that's dangerous when it is the church being influenced by the dominant values out there around us. When we become overcome or overtaken by the values that are out there. Let me give you just two examples of the church's failure when they were indoctrinated into the values of the society out around them. Germany, the 1930s. I don't know if I have to explain that to anybody. Many of the churches did not resist Hitler's nationalist anti-Semitic policies. Here's the second example. 
southern U.S., the 1950s. Many churches defended racial segregation and discrimination and resisted integration and equality. And maybe, to a certain degree, we could add residential schools and the Indian Act. As much as we knew about it. When we look back with hindsight on those examples, we see clearly that more Christians should have been a counterculture, even a resistance movement. In Nazi Germany, and many were in the southern U.S., the civil rights movement, against the prevailing mindset of the society and the government laws. Now, I acknowledge that dramatic examples like these are rare. They're really stark and clear, Germany in the 30s, Alabama in 1956. More likely, Jesus' followers will almost unknowingly drift, lose their passion for God and their distinctive lifestyle. So let's admit right here that there have been times when the majority of Christians failed in their calling. In the extreme cases, we accepted the ideology of the day, Nazism, racial segregation, and in more moderate cases, we just got too comfortable with the lifestyle of the times and we neglected our higher calling to be light and hope against dark shadows that always exist in the world. That's my first thing. Here's something else. If we truly are a colony of resident aliens, as those Duke profs labeled us, if we are a colony of resident aliens, meaning people who see themselves cosmically as having dual citizenship, then there will be an element about us that is not easily understood or embraced by outsiders. Non-Christians won't get it. They won't understand some things that we do and positions that we take. They'll find us confusing and even strange, weird. And I think we should accept that. Our worship, our lifestyle, our relationships will seem foreign to some people. We'll seem weird. And I'm okay with that. Not that I want to irritate or separate myself from our neighbors, but there is no way I can make everyone understand and accept the call to discipleship and to sacrificial servanthood. Not everyone will get it. There's no way I can quickly and easily explain the gospel and the challenges of living a Christ-like life. There's no way I can explain that in a winsome way to make any Canadian off the street immediately understand and be drawn to live that way. You can't do that with hockey or football. Think about this. You have to understand, the. if you're watching a football game, if you don't know what's the goal of the game and how it's played, it's just a mass of people running into each other. It's chaos. You have to learn the purpose of the game, what they're trying to do. Uh, you have to learn the vocabulary. That's a screen pass. He, um, he, that was a hit and run. Okay. Being on Jesus' team is something at least as challenging, invigorating, and demanding as being on a football team or a hockey team. So friends, let's just accept that part of our task is to enculturate postmodern 21st century Canadians into the culture called Christ-like discipleship. And some people won't understand, they won't get it, and we love them. We don't cajole or browbeat. We just love them with Jesus' love. 
So here's the third thing I want to say. That's the challenge right there for us. It's a mistaken assumption for a serious Christ follower to feel that our society will easily and readily comprehend and live the Christian gospel without them being changed and without a struggle at times, without having to almost reconfigure, reprogram, reboot, start over, be born again. See how I worked over to that born again? The point is, for us, for us the point is not to fit into society or get along with our culture or just go along, although most of the time I hope we can do that. And yet, the point is to change our society. Like the little colonies, and I'm pointing at that map that's not there, and Steve, don't put it up, it's okay. But like the little colonies Paul started throughout that Mediterranean world of the Roman Empire, what we are called to be is countercultural, joyfully and graciously living an alternative lifestyle. And I sense that the contrast may be coming even more stark as our society and our world slowly changes. Some developments that we're seeing are very, very good. More tolerance, more diversity. I I think we're getting there on that one. But some, I think, are dangerous. Let me remember and think out loud. I remember 15 years ago when the premier of this province said that the the provincial budget must have revenue from organized gambling, so casinos are here to stay. At one point, that was a discussion. Discussion's over. We got casinos everywhere. We have online gambling. We have ads all the time on TV for a lot of this and a lot of that. That makes me a little uneasy and sad. Here's another one, and I'm skating way out onto thin ice here, but we haven't had any law controlling the termination of unwanted pregnancies for nearly a generation. Now, let me quickly say, without pushing for or advocating in any way for a woman who terminates an unplanned pregnancy to be made a criminal, I'm not advocating for that. I would like the Christian community to become part of a solution to bring more crisis pregnancies to birth and to care for both the mother and the baby. A year and a half ago, when I was first getting plugged in here, uh, my first December here, I was so pleased, and Nancy and I were uh, eager that this congregation was making a specific effort to support the pregnancy center in Kitchener, which offers support to anyone experiencing an unplanned pregnancy. And to that, and to Calvary, I say, hooray. That's the kind of positive solution and compassionate action that we can take. Let me go back into that ancient Roman world. Not surprisingly, wide open exploitive gambling was completely available. And infanticide, unwanted babies were thrown out into the street or into the dump. Those were two practices the early Christians faced in that Roman Empire. I don't think we're heading back into first century atmosphere like Corinth had, where Paul planted his tiny church. Nevertheless, we might understand the situation better if we always watch for the similarities. Be aware between our present circumstances and those of that ancient world. As we do, we will hopefully be inspired to live out a more passionate version of Christ following. Maybe we, maybe we in Waterloo Region can have the kind of impact in our time and place that that early church had on the Roman Empire and on all of history. 
Jesus bids us shine then for all around. Many kinds of darkness in the world are found. Sin and want and sorrow, so we must shine. You in your small corner and I in mine. Let's pray and work for a church that again asserts that God, not any God ultimately rules the world and the universe. The boundaries of God's kingdom transcend those of any Caesar and that the main task of the church is the formation of people who see clearly what is at its best, what it should be, what the cost to achieve that will be and then are willing to pay the price to achieve that. This year, may Calvary and all who come here be a people who live singing this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Amen. Can we pray for a moment? Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. We thank you. We thank you that we are citizens of Canada, free, so much good here. We give you our gratitude. We invite your Holy Spirit into our earthly nation and into the leadership, all of our elected officials. Help them, love them, guide them, Lord, and help us to be good citizens. And then also, Lord, turn us loose as citizens of your kingdom, the community of Christ, the family of God. Let us live completely by those values and let them ripple out into our great nation. Come, Holy Spirit, live and work in us. Through Christ's name, amen. So we're going to sing Set a Fire together. This has been a pretty constant refrain in this past season as we've been stepping into what Jesus holds for us. So out of Orville's teaching this morning, Thank you for that. As the uh, within the within the dual citizenships that we hold, that culture, that presence of Jesus that we get to carry. Now, would you just stretch out your hand this morning, and even as we sing, uh, set a fire this morning. If we allow Jesus to fill us fully like the promise in John 15 where he says, remain in me and I will remain in you. Then our spirits can't help but move. Our spirits cannot help but act because Jesus is in us and is the one that is moved. Uh, so Jesus, we again cry out for more of you this morning, a greater desire to seek your presence a greater desire to be filled to the brim and overflowing with you into every interaction, every situation, every simple or complicated choice out of the citizenships you have blessed us with us. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. body of Christ broken for you. I want to invite you to join me in a prayer. It will be on screen and it's a, a responsive prayer. I will read one part. I'm one and you are many. This is your table, Lord, not ours. None of us deserves to sit at your right hand.
Savior. Yet you have given your body to be sacrificed for us. What a feast of love you have given us. What priceless redemption you have bestowed upon us. Baptize us in your Holy Spirit that all things may become new and that this table may truly sit at the center of our lives. Amen. I'm hoping most of you here and all of you at home have elements there, a bread, a cracker, whatever you have. Let us share from our Lord's table. On the night when he was first betrayed, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, Almighty God, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Likewise, near the end of the supper, Jesus took a cup and gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me, the blood of Christ shed for us. Bow and pray with me for a moment. Again, Holy Spirit of the living Christ, we welcome you amongst us. We give you our thanks and our praise. For you are King and Lord, and we delight in being your subjects, your creation, and you have adopted us into your family. We are your children. Praise and thanks to you, O God. Send us from this place as joyful, winsome servants and witnesses to your love. Come, empower, send. For the sake of Christ and in his name, amen and amen. you leave this place this morning be blessed into the into what comes into the rest of this day and into this week and all that is to come if you would like to receive a blessing this morning if you would like prayer for something this morning we have uh, amazing people for you to, to speak with and pray with this morning the zoom link is below if you're online And we've got prayer support here uh, offered in the sanctuary as well. Uh, I think Grace is already in the back corner there. Uh, so if, if, if you've been feeling nudged or even unsettled this morning, God is in the midst of that and there is more to come. So please take advantage of those opportunities to be blessed, to, be rece to receive prayer, um, and even to, uh, even to know what God's words over, over you are this morning. So we're going to sing you out. Blessings on your week. And on all that is to come.